Hello everyone, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the Ring Theory Lectures. We've been talking about chain conditions, and I want to take a look now. We've, we just took a, a brief look at Noetherian rings, rings with the ascending chain condition. Let's take a look now at Artinian rings. And for the most part, I'm going to restrict attention to commutative Artinian rings, where life is considerably simpler than it is in the non-commutative case. The plan is to prove the following facts concerning commutative Artinian rings. All non-zero non-units of R are zero divisors, and so the ring R can be partitioned into three distinct blocks, the zero divisors, the units, and the zero element, which is not a zero divisor, nor is it a unit. An ideal of R is prime if and only if it's maximal, and so as a consequence, the Jacobson radical, which is the intersection of all maximal ideals, is equal to the nil radical, which is the intersection of all prime ideals. This radical, the Jacobson nil radical, is nil potent, meaning that <clears throat> there is a positive integer s for which j to the s is zero. <clears throat> R has only finitely many <clears throat> maximal ideals. <clears throat> An Artinian ring is the direct product of a finite number of Artinian local rings. Remember that a local ring is a ring with a unique maximal ideal. So this is a structure theorem. <clears throat> it tells us something about the structure of Artinian rings. They are direct products of a finite number of special types of Artinian rings, local rings. <clears throat> All Artinian rings are strongly associate. Every commutative Artinian ring is Noetherian. <clears throat> this is true without the commutative requirement, as we discussed, but we're going to prove it only in the commutative case. So, <clears throat> let's get down to work. <clears throat> First step, <clears throat> all non-zero, non-units are zero divisors. <clears throat> in any ring, Zero divisors are non-units, <clears throat> but the converse is false in general, um, and you can see that in the polynomial ring. But in a commutative Artinian ring, the non-zero units are zero divisors. The non-zero non-units are zero divisors. <clears throat> so here's the theorem. For any commutative Artinian ring R, we have this decomposition. So every proper ideal of R contains only zero divisors. Every Artinian integral domain is a field. Well, once we've proven one, <clears throat> then we know that Two follows because an Artinian integral domain is first of all it's commutative. <clears throat> it has no zero divisors, and so R is simply the uh, disjoint union of the units and the set containing the zero element. So all non-zero elements are units, and that makes R a field. So part one is the meat of the problem, but. <clears throat> If we take an element, a non-zero element A from R, and look at this descending sequence of ideals, it must become constant at some point. So there's an integer K for which 
the ideal generated by a to the k is the same as the next ideal generated by a to the k plus 1, which means there is an element little r in the ring for which a to the k is r a to the k plus 1. That can be written this way. <clears throat> so, if a is not a zero divisor, remember a is non-zero, we've already uh, assume that. <clears throat> if a is not a zero divisor, then neither is a to the k, and so 1 minus ra has to be zero, and a is a unit. So if a is non-zero and not a unit, uh, not a zero divisor, it's got to be a unit. <clears throat> Prime ideals are maximal. We know that maximal ideals are always prime. The converse does not hold in general, but it does hold in commutative Artinian rings. And this actually has some very important implications. <clears throat> so, let R be a commutative Artinian ring. An ideal of R is prime if and only if it's maximal. It follows that the Jacobson radical and the nil radical coincide. And also, if M and N are prime ideals, then their product is equal to their intersection. <clears throat> part 3 follows from Part 1 and a theorem from Chapter 2, because maximal ideals are coprime. <clears throat> and so all we really need to prove here is part one. Part two follows immediately from part one and the definitions of the two radicals. But there's a very simple and very elegant proof of part one. <clears throat> if R is Artinian and P is a prime ideal, oops, I got a little, uh, this, I should be P, then the quotient R mod P is an Artinian integral domain. Okay, it's Artinian. We had a theorem to that effect. If R is Artinian, so are the quotients of R, the quotient rings. <clears throat> and since P is prime, the quotient's an integral domain. It's an Artinian integral domain, which we know is a field, and so the ideal P is maximal. Okay. This is the power of some of the results we have already proven. <clears throat> now let's prove that a commutative Artinian ring has only finitely many maximal ideals. Suppose that a commutative Artinian ring R has infinitely many distinct maximal ideals, this sequence M1, M2, and so on. And consider this decreasing chain of successive intersections. Because R is Artinian, this has to be constant after some point, so there has to be an integer k for which this intersection equals this intersection. And so the intersection m1 through mk is contained in mk plus 1. Now, these ideals are maximal, therefore they are pairwise co-prime. And again, a theorem, a theorem from chapter 2 then implies that the product is equal to the intersection. So this product, m1 through mk, is contained in mk plus 1. But maximal ideals are prime, and so another theorem from chapter 2 implies that each of these ideals is contained in this one. I'm sorry, not each of these. One of these is contained in this one. Okay. <clears throat> That's a theorem 
2.38. One of these ideals, M1 through MK, is contained in MK plus 1. That is false because those ideals are distinct and both of them are maximal. So we have a contradiction which tells us there can only be finitely many maximal ideals. The Jacobson radical is nilpotent. Now, as you may know from your study of group theory, every group of finite exponent is periodic. But there are periodic groups that do not have finite exponent. And we can make an analogous statement concerning ideals in a ring, but we need to set some terminology. An ideal I of a ring is nilpotent if there's an integer n, positive integer n, for which i to the n is the zero ideal. The smallest such positive integer n is called the index of nilpotence of the ideal. And i is nil if every element of i is nilpotent. So for each element, a and i, there's a positive integer, n sub a, which may depend on a, for which a to that power n sub a is 0. Now, if i is nilpotent, say i to the n is the 0 ideal, then every element in i is nilpotent. And so um, i is a nil ideal. Nilpotent ideals are nil. But the converse is not true. And I left that for the exercises. So being nilpotent is much stronger <clears throat> than being nil. And that should make sense. And that's the same situation we have in group theory. <clears throat> Having finite exponent is much stronger than just being periodic. We saw in Chapter 2, Theorem 2.41, that the nil radical of a commutative ring R, which is by definition the intersection of all the prime ideals in R, is also the set of all nilpotent elements of R. And so it is, in fact, nil. In a commutative Artinian ring, R, the nil radical, which is the same as the Jacobson radical, has the stronger property of being nil potent. There's a single exponent that kills everything. <clears throat> As to the proof, Let's just sit, write J for this radical. It's the Jacobson radical and the nil radical, because these are equal. Look at this descending chain, powers of the radical. This has to stabilize, so there's an, a positive integer S for which J to the S is equal to J to the S plus I for all positive I. If j to the s is the zero ideal, then of course we're done. We know that j is nilpotent. So suppose j to the s is not zero. Now we want to examine the family f of all ideals i of r for which i j to the s is not zero. So multiplication by i does not kill j to the s. Well, j times j to the s is j to the s plus 1, which is equal to j to the s, which is non-zero. And so j belongs to this family, and so the family's not empty. You know, when you define a family of whatever, you need to check first. First thing that should go through your mind is, is this family empty or non-empty?
So the minimal condition on ideals implies that there is a minimal ideal i for which i j to the s is non-zero. This ideal i happens to be principal because if you take an element a and i that does not annihilate j to the s, and there must be at least one, then the ideal generated by a j to the s is non-zero. And so the minimality of i tells us that, in fact, i is equal to this principal ideal. Now, if we take the ideal generated by a times j to the s, which is non-zero, multiply by j to the s, we can write it this way, but j to the 2s is j to the s because of this, and this is non-zero, and so this ideal belongs to the family f. It is, of course, contained in this ideal, but this is minimal, and so these are equal. That tells us that little a belongs to this ideal. And so you have to think about what the elements of this sort of thing look like, a product of ideals. <clears throat> there exists elements r sub k in the ring and l sub k in j to the s for which a has this form. Multiple of a times element of j to the s plus dot 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 plus another, multi another multiple of a, an element of this principal ideal, times an element of j to the s. You can factor out a and denote this by script L, which belongs to j to the s because each of the L sub i's does. Therefore, since the elements of j to the s are nilpotent, <clears throat> there is an, a positive integer n for which L to the n is 0, so a equals a to the L. That's what we discovered here. Using that again, replace a by a to the l, we get a to the l squared. Keep doing that until you hit a l to the n, which is 0. a is 0. That's a contradiction. <clears throat> so j to the s is, in fact, the trivial ideal. j is nilpotent. This theorem that the Jacobson radical is nilpotent has an important corollary that we're going to need later on. Let R be a commutative Artinian ring and let J to the R, this is the JR, this is the Jacobson radical to the power S be trivial. If the maximal ideals of R are m1 through mn, remember there's only a finite number of them, then this product is also trivial. And the proof is just one line, since the maximal ideals are also prime, in fact co-prime, this product of powers of the ideals here can be written this way because of the commutativity and this product is this intersection, because these are co-prime. And <clears throat> uh, this is the Jacobson radical. So that's J of R to the S, and that's zero. This is, this is, at this moment, it's not clear what the point here is, but... Yeah, that will appear later on in this in the lecture. <clears throat>
Artinian local rings have some interesting properties. First of all, we've seen that in any Artinian ring, R, we can write this decomposition. Zero divisors, units, and zero element. Now, a theorem back in chapter 2 tells us that for a local ring, the unique maximal ideal of R is this set of non-units, which then looks like this in this case. So <clears throat> if R is a commutative Artinian local ring, its unique maximal ideal is the set of zero divisors together with zero. It follows that R is strongly associate. And to prove that, suppose we have two elements A and B, each of which divides the other. And we can assume they're non-zero. Then A is equal to RB, which is equal to RSA. So we can write this. Now, if either R or S is a unit, we are done, because then the two elements are unit-related. And that means that R is strongly associate. Mutual divisors are unit-related. The converse is always true. So if neither R nor S is a unit, neither one is a unit, then they belong to this ideal M, the unique maximal ideal. They're non-units, so they're zero divisors. So it follows that the product is also a non-unit, because M is an ideal. And so 1 minus SR is not in M. M is a maximal ideal. It's not everything. And since SR is in M, if this were in M, 1 would be in M, which is not true. So this is not in M, and therefore it's a unit. And that implies that A equals 0, which is a contradiction. So one of our RS has to be a unit. Now we have what we need to prove an important structure theorem concerning commutative Artinian rings. A commutative Artinian ring is the direct product of a finite number of commutative Artinian local rings. I can't really expect you to appreciate why this is an important structure theorem. It would require further study of rings, which is beyond our scope. Uh, so you have to just sort of accept the fact that this is a, uh, an important structure theorem. So let the maximal ideals of R be M1 through Mn. We know there's only finitely many and let I be the product of these ideals. Since they're maximal, they're co-prime, and so the product is equal to the intersection. That's the Jacobson radical, which is also equal to the nil radical. And therefore, we know this is nil potent. Say I to the S is the zero ideal. All this is material we've just gone through. So the product of mi to the s is the product of mi then raised to the s power, which is i to the s, which is trivial. These ideals, mi to the s, are pairwise co-prime, proof of which I'm leaving as an exercise. So the Chinese remainder theorem, 
gives us R, which is isomorphic to R mod the trivial ideal, which is equal to R mod the product of these ideals. And this is where the Chinese remainder theorem comes in. That's the direct product of these quotients. It's isomorphic, not equal. This is equality, but these are isomorphisms. This quotient, each of these quotients, is Artinian, and the correspondence theorem tells that, us that there is an order preserving one-to-one -one correspondence between the ideals of this quotient and the ideals of R that contain this ideal, mi to the s. But the ideals, the set of ideals of R that, are, that contain mi to the s has only one maximal ideal. Because if n is in here and is maximal, then n is also prime. And since it contains mi to the s, <clears throat> it contains mi because n is prime. And therefore, because mi is maximal, these are equal. So each of these quotients has only one maximal ideal, looks like this, therefore it's a local ring. And so we have our structure theorem. <clears throat> therefore, commutative Artinian rings are strongly associated. Because, as we've just seen, we can write R as a direct product of Artinian local rings. We know each of these is strongly associate. And I'll leave it to you to show, therefore, that R is strongly associate. We now come to the finale. Artinian rings are Noetherian. This is the akazuki hopkins levitsky theorem. It says the descending chain condition implies the ascending chain condition. And we're going to prove it for commutative rings. Now we're ready to turn our attention to the akazuki hopkins levitsky theorem which says that the descending chain condition implies the ascending chain condition. Or in other words, Artinian rings are Noetherian. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to prove this theorem for commutative rings. So to begin with, we need to speak briefly about vector spaces. The following are equivalent for a vector space V over a field F. V is finite dimensional. V has the ACC on subspaces. And V has the DCC on subspaces. The proof is quite simple. A finite dimensional vector space will have both chain conditions on subspaces because if S and T are subspaces and S is contained in T, then the dimension of S is less than the dimension of T, which is, of course, less than or equal to the dimension of the whole space, which is finite. So there simply isn't room for an infinite proper chain of subspaces in either direction, because there's not enough, there aren't enough dimensions. On the other hand, if V is infinite dimensional, it will have an infinite linearly independent subset, a countably infinite one in particular. And so <clears throat> this is an infinite, strictly decreasing chain of subspaces, and this is an infinite, strictly increasing chain of subspaces, and so V has neither chain condition. And that completes the proof. <clears throat> now, the plan 
is to leverage this theorem to help prove that a commutative ring R that has the DCC also has the ACC. And of course, for this to succeed, we need two things, a field and a vector space. So we have our uh, ring R with the DCC. A maximal ideal of R will provide us with a field, namely the quotient R mod M. As to the vector space, suppose that I is any ideal of R, then I is an additive group, and it will be a vector space if we can find a suitable scalar multiplication. And that would be multiplication by the elements of R mod M, the cosets of M. And here is an obvious choice. Coset R plus M times A is RA. But we must immediately examine the issue of well-definedness because it sure looks like this proposal depends on the choice of coset representative. So we need to examine this condition and to see what it takes for it to be true, R plus M equals S plus M implies RA equals SA, or this is another way to write it. And since R minus S is an arbitrary element of M, it comes down to this, or equivalently, MI must be the zero ideal. So this calls for a definition. Let R be a ring, let I be an ideal of R. The annihilator of I is the set of all elements in the ring that, well, you would say annihilate I. In other words, A times I is the zero ideal. In fact, if for any element or any subset that lies in the annihilator, we'll say that that element or that subset annihilates I. So our scalar multiplication, the one that we just tried to define, will be well-defined if and only if the maximal ideal is contained in the annihilator of I. So we'll need to assume that. I'm going to leave it as an exercise to show that the vector space properties or four properties of scalar multiplication do hold for this well-defined scalar multiplication. And so, if the maximal ideal M annihilates I, then I is an R mod M vector space. What about the subspaces of this vector space? Well, any ideal J of R that is contained in I is also annihilated by M. It's a subset of I, uh, so it's annihilated by M, and so J is also an R mod M vector space, and therefore a subspace of I. Conversely, if S is a subspace of the R mod M vector space I, then S is an additive group, it's an additive subgroup of I, and it's an ideal because if we take of R, because we take an element of R and an element of S, their product AS is equal to this. The definition of this is this, and this belongs to S because S is a subspace and therefore closed under scalar multiplication. So I is in fact an ideal of, um, I'm sorry, S is an ideal of R contained in, uh, in J. So the ideals, the subspaces of the vector space I are precisely the ideals of R that are contained in I. <clears throat> and that's what this statement is.
So what we've done is we've linked the structures from two different areas of mathematics, ideals and vector spaces. And we can leverage this link using this theorem. Finite dimensionality is equivalent to either chain condition on subspaces. Suppose that I is an ideal of R that is annihilated by a maximal ideal M. So I is then a vector space over R, oh, over uh, R mod M. Now R it has the a DCC on ideals, it's Artinian, therefore I has that property, and so the vector space, the R mod M vector space I has the DCC on subspaces. And that theorem I just showed you then says that I also has the ACC on subspaces and therefore the ACC on ideals. This is very slick. So let R be an Artinian ring and suppose that I, an ideal of R, is annihilated by a maximal ideal M. Then I has the ACC on ideals. Now the condition that I be annihilated by a maximal ideal is a bit harsh, but we can do something about that as follows. First, suppose that I is annihilated by a product of two maximal ideals, Mn. Then we can show that I has the ACC on ideals by applying the previous theorem twice. First of all, the ideal Ni is annihilated by the maximal ideal M, so Ni has the ACC on ideals. Second, since N is a maximal ideal of R, the correspondence theorem tells us that N mod Ni is a maximal ideal of R mod Ni. Also, N mod Ni this maximal ideal annihilates the ideal I mod Ni. And that's very straightforward, so I'll let you do that. So, again, this theorem tells us that I mod Ni has the ACC on ideals. So both Ni and I mod Ni have the ACC, therefore so does I. Now, a simple inductive argument will prove the following. Suppose that R is a commutative Artinian ring. I is an ideal that's annihilated by a finite product of maximal ideals. Then I has the ACC. We are very close now. We want to apply these results to the ideal I equals R to conclude that R itself has the ACC. So we need a product of maximal ideals that annihilates the whole ring R. That is the purpose of an earlier corollary, 719, which says that if M1 through Mn are the maximal ideals of R, there is a positive integer S for which this product is zero, the zero ideal. And the zero ideal certainly annihilates R. And we are finished. We have proved the commutative version of the Akazuki-Hopkins-Levitsky theorem.